All right. Well, thank you uh, for joining us here today um, for the Road to Carrier IP Network Transformation, Avoiding the Potholes, which uh, I think we all, between everyone's here on the panel, we know there's potholes. We've been there, right? right. Yep. So I want to thank, uh, thank everyone for joining us here today. Thanks to the panel for, um, for joining us today and sharing your thoughts. Uh, so let's uh, learn about our panel. So I'm Alan Percy. I'm the uh, moderator for today's event. I'm also the Chief Marketing Officer at Telco Bridges and uh, happy to have with us uh, a great group of people here. And so Jason, why don't you introduce yourself real quick and we'll yep. go from there. Yep. I'm Jason Byrne. I'm uh, the SVP of Marketing for Crescendo. We are a cloud communications platform provider, UCAS, CCAS, and CPAS. Um, and we've got a little over 4 million users on our platform, just over added over a million us uh, users in the last year. And then Frost and Sullivan just ranked us as the fastest growing platform uh, in North America. So uh, That's great. Congratulations. Great trajectory we're on. Yeah, yeah, I'm a good partner. And Anthony. Thank you, Alan. My name is Anthony Marcello, Director of Sales at Alianza. We are also a cloud voice services provider, really focusing on uh, providing our services to carriers, um, particularly in the heartland of North America, to uh, help them modernize and, and do this network transformation that we're here to talk about today. Been in the industry for about uh, 30 plus years now, so it's, a, it's been a long experience, but uh, very grateful for the time here today. That's great, thanks Anthony. And then uh, Mark, how about a quick intro? So I'm Mark Sudo with Totally Digital Networks, and do I dare say we're another cloud voice provider? <laughs> Actually, we've done a lot more. We do anything that has to do with voice services for the rural telephone market. And that's who we've been servicing for about 28 years now. So anything related to voice services, we help them with, which ties very tightly into what we're talking about today, since they're all going through a period of not only just moving to the cloud for their voice services, but also trying to come up with ways to get rid of the old traditional TDM trunking, how to move away from the old tandem services. So. We do a little bit of all that for the rural telephone companies. Right, right. And I, and I should mention, too, that one of the, um, with our panelists here, so between Jason and Anthony, those are um, primarily the software platforms, and Mark's uh, company is mostly focused on implementation, right? So it's a little bit closer to I the street. I think that's a good point, yeah. Yep. Because I think we'll use, obviously we partner with Crescendo yep. and, and Jason to provide some of the voice service platforms that we do, as well as Telco Bridges, yep. you know, to help yep. them when they're, especially dealing with the TDM trunking. Right, so. and that gives us a little bit of a different perspective as we work through it. Right. So let's move on and you know, we'll start with a couple of lead-in questions and we'll talk about um, the, basically what's the challenge first. And I think one of the first questions that would be an obvious one is like, what is network transformation? So I put together a couple of slides that just at a very, very high level explain uh, the, what network transformation is, at least from our perspective, and we'll, we'll pick it up from there. But you know, in general, I think most service providers, if you actually were to decompose a network and take a look at it, you would find uh, um, something similar to what we have on the diagram here, which is there's a legacy TDM switch, probably bought sometime in the 1980s or 90s, uh, and it generally has um, three core elements to it. One of them is there's a trunk side, which faces the interconnect trunks of the, of the other operators, right? When you make a phone call, you usually like to be able to call outside your own neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So you have either international, national, or interconnect o operators, and generally those interfaces are either done with SS7 circuits or uh, other TDM technology. And the other side of the switch then is some kind of access side, which is either residential, business, or enterprise interconnect that goes with it. Uh, and then the core of it is some kind of switching logic, right? There's routing tables and switching logic so that when um, you, you pick up the phone to dial, it knows how to direct your call, plus a lot of what we call class five services. And we can probably talk about what some of those services are as we go along here. But it's, you know, the dial tone and, and uh, busy signals and, and um, things like voicemail and, uh, and uh, those kinds of features uh, would go with it. So then when we move over to a transformed network, what we're aiming for, I think in general, is moving this to a data-centric application where we're going to put data switching in the core and we're going to use some intelligence, a soft switch or you know, a UC platform of some type or another to make the intelligence uh, come to be. And that might be in a private cloud or might be in a public cloud in environment uh, or just private data center environment. But we're, we still need to make that connectivity to the legacy either interconnect operators or the residential and business operators. 
And that's where we come to play with our, our gateways, either our SS7 signaling gateways or our access uh, gateways that um, sit on either side. And that gets, goes a little bit further and you look into a bigger, more complex network, then of course you know you've got multiple uh, uh, central offices that might be interconnected. And again, they're all going to be interconnected now in the transform network in a pure uh, IP environment. Again, still using a common soft switch. And this is where some of the value I think starts to happen is you're sharing a single soft switch platform, redundant soft switch platform, uh, to be able to do all the intelligence or provide the features so that, um, so that those you know, international and national interconnects and the, and the subscribers can all interconnect together. So now I'm going to turn to the panel and ask the first question, which is, you know, why are service providers transforming their networks? And so, Jason, we're just going to start with you since you're close. Sure. <laughs> it's all about where you sit. So, yeah, right, right. Um, well, certainly there's, I think, look at it from two sides, right? There's the push side, which is costs, uh, vendor equipment going, you know, out of date and not being replaced, maintenance, um, spare parts, whatever it is, happens to be from a, from a push standpoint. But the pull is probably the largest um, I'd say gravitational force rather than the push, which is what additional services can I add? What additional value can I bring to the table when I move to the IP, you know, and cloud-based infrastructure? I think that's probably, you know, where the, the pull is much rather than the push. And the cost savings, the benefits certainly are on that, from that push side on the cost savings, the maintenance, uh, speed to, to market, and then ramping up new services. Uh, you know, service creation becomes mm -hmm. ex exponentially quicker and exponentially more applications can actually be used, so. Right. Yeah. Okay. So maybe, Anthony, why, maybe you could add a little bit of value from the, you know, we'll talk about maybe the end of life side of the equation, yeah. right? Yeah, I was going to, I was going to mention that. Another key uh, aspect of that transformation is the fact that they can't get equipment from perhaps the vendors that they uh, originally bought right. their right. legacy switch or even their soft switch particularly in, in the space of uh, companies like uh, MetaSwitch and, uh, and Broadsoft who've been acquired by larger companies and are mm -hmm. pretty much choosing to, to let those products um, go away. So, so I, uh, you know, uh, I, I completely agree this idea that it's a push-pull with economic savings and advantages that you get from uh, opportunities and revenue with new applications. And, and you throw in the fact that you don't have any other choices, well, I, I, it's a no-brainer, and that right. and that really is kind of the state of the industry. Right. I think in 2024, right now. Sure, sure. And then, Mark, maybe maybe a, some first-hand story. Maybe you, you could do it, maybe blind, but tell us, you know, give, give you know, give us an example, maybe of somebody that what they did and needed why they needed to do the transformation. Sure, because as you know, we we work in a unique market where we work with telephone companies that have been traditional telcos. We started, you know, 1995 offering voice services and it was all TDM based. But now all those companies have become broadband companies. You know, they're, they're all the support mechanisms that were going to them to be traditional telephone companies has been driven by the FCC to become more broadband oriented and they're becoming broadband companies. So they got two things pulling them. One is they're getting um, the support mechanisms that kept them going for so many years have faded. So as they're using an old, back to the old push, if they were using an old Takwa switch, Takwa's going to come in and say, now, we don't support that anymore. You have to get something new. But then at the same time, the support mechanisms that paid for that new switch in the past are gone. So now they got to take that out of pocket. Yep. So now they start thinking, okay, wait, there's got to be a better solution. And I think I, I might be jumping ahead, or there was somewhere I saw just recently, I was looking at something, but where, you know, you talk about, um, you know, CapEx versus OpEx. Now, the, what used to be an easy no-brainer to go with CapEx, all of a sudden it's like, well, wait, I don't, I don't have that kind of money to fork out anymore. So now they're looking at other solutions, which gets into things like, you know, Crescendo and their cloud products that might help... Um, for them to go to more of an OPEX type solution. Right. So we've worked with a variety of them. So we had one recently, um, you talked about an example, so I apologize, I went off track a little bit, but we had a small one just recently that said same thing. They, got, they had to get off their um, switch. It was out, out of date, wasn't gonna be supported anymore. And on top of all that, the cost of the TDM trunking that they were using, because I work in a world where they're all still connected to tandems and they yep. have interconnect, old interconnect agreements and they're saying, how do we get out from under all this? So we had to work through a variety of different issues with them to get them to that point on how they could get rid of their, um, 
uh, their TDM trunking, and we did. We ended up moving their, uh, their tandem to a, a cloud-based tandem solution. That got rid of that TDM trunking. We worked with some gateways, i.e. telco bridges, you mm -hmm. know, to make sure that the, tandem, the TDM trunking they had left could still be supported. Mm -hmm. And then they moved all their customers to the um, cloud-based voice system, which was Crescendos, mm -hmm. and which we like a lot because, again, we see it as kind of the up-and-comer. Like he mentioned how much it's growing and what they're doing. Um, we see people wanting to use it for two reasons. they got to get a new switch, and again, I can take them to a better model with Crescendo. But on top of that, back to features, kind of the pull with their local business customers are they need more features. Yeah. They can't use the features that are available on the old switches. So sometimes they'll start using the, the product for their business customer base within their footprint before they actually make the commitment to move everything over you know, sure. for their, their other customer base. Yep. But anyway, long answer to your question. Yeah, no, no, that was exactly what I was looking for. So that's, that's very interesting. And, and just before we move on, so you know, maybe just give me an idea, what, what are some of these features that are driving this, this kind of move forward? So maybe you want to start, Mark, with firsthand. Okay. Yeah, I, I would say that some of the things that make it really important are, number one, you know, you're, you're going to be able to do things like a mobile app, which they would never have availability to. You can do SMS on the platform, which they wouldn't have availability to. Um, I'm trying to think of what some of the ones are that really jump out from there, but there's quite a few. I mean, when you look at the platform, little things that are in there too, like text to voice, you know, yeah. and just little extra bonuses that they can't get, and being able to tie multiple offices. Actually, the biggest thing they come to me with is, I have a customer, a big business customer in my footprint, but they have multiple offices, mm -hmm. and I can't support multiple offices. Can you help me? I said, yeah, we can. Let's work through the cloud platform, and we can tie all those offices together. One, this happened recently. You mean like a single dial bank. plan kind of thing? Or? Uh, not just dial plan, but, but they all want to be on the same PBX platform so they can talk to each other and not have to dial uh, long okay. distance to do it. Yeah. You know? yep, yep. So they want to tie it all together at all the different branches and offices. So the newer services allow them to do that. The previous environment where the switch was just in their central office did not allow them to accomplish that. Okay. So. Anything to add, Anthony? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I, I think there are some also subtle uh, uh, things that, that may uh, you know, kind of elude most of our customers today. Um, and I think they're centered around the idea of cloud mm -hmm. and the implications of cloud. 2024 is certainly a cloud era. I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure that nobody here is watching DVDs uh, at home, even though we all have them in the garage somewhere. Maybe at your parents' house, they're sitting in a garage yeah. somewhere. The reality is, is that um, uh, the essence of the cloud is changing the way that we look at how to use applications and how they're being deployed um, in benefit of our customers. There's nothing really new about voicemail, but yet Apple, when it introduced, uh, you know, it's voicemail, you, you see experience on phone, everybody, oh, wow, I can look at the scroll of my, of my voice messages. Well, that feature's been around since 1985. So it's very much Groundhog Day in terms yeah. of applications. But what is cloud doing? Cloud is bringing a couple of key aspects to it. First, it's developing on a platform based on microservices so that it can scale right. linearly. And, and quickly. Uh, we can go from very small implementations to very large with zero disruption to customer service. Sure. So as a service provider is looking at those implementations and scaling their network, man, that is a big benefit. Uh, again, not necessarily transparent to customers, but something that underlies it. But when you look at AI today, and, and particularly analytics, these are cloud technologies. Mm -hmm. And being able to plug into the cloud cleanly and effectively with those microservices architectures and leverage that AI infrastructure and those data analytics to come up with new ways to look at what your customers are servicing, what types of outages and needs that you have, what types of network optimizations, software upgrades, all of the inherent pieces that sure. go into a network management. Man, what a great time to be in telecommunications. We get to bring all of the stuff that we've done before, but bring it into a new world uh, enabled by better, faster, smarter AI and analytics tools that we have. Oh, I pinch myself all the time. This is the best industry to it's, be in. It is. It's fun. It's, it's fun because we get to talk about yeah. that, that on a new, you yeah. know, a new wavelength. Yeah. It's fast moving. <laughs> yeah, it's fast moving. Yeah, so Jason, maybe we just can add a little bit here, maybe a couple examples of some uh, enhanced services 
that have value and maybe can add value um, above and beyond just plain old dial tone, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, the reliability and scalability, I think that's all table stakes. I mean, you know, for most of the rural folks out there, and we all have to get it right, I, I totally agree. But the, the, the pull is definitely the applications, the value-added applications that exist right, out there, right. right? And if it's a business end user, then certainly, back to Mark's point, is you know, the plethora of applications surely built on, to, on top of UCAS, but also every business is a, is a contact center. Yeah. You know, so now contact center applications are now being thrown point. in yeah. right into right. the mix. And now you've got a, a whole different magnitude of profitability when you get into contact center. Right. Um, and now if you wrap, I mean, some of the themes here at the show have been around CPaaS, right? So mm -hmm. rich media is coming on strong, right? Mm -hmm. There's been a massive mm -hmm. increase since the iPhone uh, let RCS come through uh, on their phone last year. And there's been like a 25,000 fold increase in RCS. So you're going wow. to see a lot more, yeah. you know, it's not just SMS anymore. It'll be much more rich media, some branding going along with that. So there's huge amounts of applications, both on the UCAS side, but CCAS. And then when you involve all these different APIs, what I, I referred to in my other session was Lego blocks, right? Yep. There's only, X, I think there's only 130 different connectors in Lego. But how many masterpieces have you seen in the world? Sure. Same goes for APIs. If we actually arm them with, the tools to go build what they want and embed right. into their niches because no platform vendor is going to know all the different use cases. Sure. Give them the tools to build the masterpiece they're looking for and then that, that rural provider can now add huge amounts of value and a magnitude difference in profitability. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I just I want to agree with that API aspect of it. I think the biggest segment that we're seeing right now in, in the UC growth is specialized customization yeah. of those UC applications. Yeah, which I, I've always believed that one of the real value adds, especially for you know consultants and resellers and all that, has been able to uh, you know to adapt their communication platform to their business to the vertical market. I've always thought you know because a lawyer's office is not the same as a hospital, which is not the same as a school district, which is not the same as a you know a traditional. Um, uh, knowledge worker, so yeah, that's. A, and they that's all have different thing. CRMs. Some are even, in, in, you know, built in house, and you've got to be yeah. able to integrate for that. Yep. And we're finding the most stickiest of our partners are the ones who build themselves into that, you know, homegrown CRM Correct. or even CDP behind it, right? So, yep. those are the ones that we're seeing that grow the most. Certainly, the ones sure. investing. The biggest issue then becomes, well, do I need to hire developers, or do I need no code and low code? That's the next generation yep. conversation that's going to happen. Yep. All right, so let's change the subject a little bit. Let's talk about the regulatory environment. And I, I think this is so, something in our, in our prep work we, we talked about. This is one of the hurdles that is with us, right? So that, as we know, telecom's pretty regulated, right? It's probably one of the more regulated right behind healthcare when it comes to uh, um, what happens. So, you know, the some of the regulatory uh, decisions more recently have uh, opened it up, but also at the same time, too, have, have put some constraints in it. So maybe we could go down the line. Um, we could start maybe with Jason this time. How, you know, how does the regulatory environment change when you move to the cloud? And what are some of the concerns that providers are seeing yeah. with the new regulatory environment? I, th I think, Mark, you'd know much more about on the, on the TDM side with NECA touch and on some of that. USF and, and the CAF funding and stuff. But when it comes to, certainly on the cloud side, the handcuffs are by and large off when it comes yeah. to that. Except when it comes to cybersecurity, that's when things get, you know, you do, certainly that's one of the biggest aspects. And probably the tightest handcuffs will be around that. Um, even, you know, uh, even on all the AI conversations that are going on, and especially around low code and no code, folks are scrambling to figure out how to, to secure those transactions, those okay. conversational intelligence. But uh, certainly not as restrictive as where Mark's been dealing with in, in, the, in the past. Yep. Yeah, Anthony, anything? anything? Quick? Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think it's important to understand that from a, a regulatory standpoint, many of our telecommunications carriers are, are, are responsible for both federal and local types uh, of regulations and, and, and requirements. Again, many of this has been structured and centered around a compensation that have allowed them to provide services uh, to their companies uh, and to yeah. their customers, uh, you know, through uh, USF, managed by NECA through, mm -hmm. through, uh, mm -hmm. with USF funds. Um, those pieces, in, in terms of being able to qualify for those types of funds, 
have have requirements yeah. and and they're slow to change yeah. um, and as a result of that um, you know there needs to be things in their network to address them and you know telco bridges for example this is a, a big part of the solution uh, anchoring the the gateway in, in the network to to alleviate some of those requirements but um, what you have to do is I, I think continue to lobby uh, within the effective state organizations for modernization of those rules uh, to be a bit more um, enabled for, for IP communications in the future, but also recognize that uh, they're still there today and there That's needs to be a bridge to tomorrow. And, and I, matter of fact, I'm going to move to the next slide um, because we did sort of prep this. So, Mark, why don't you tell us about NECA compliant? What is it? Why is it important? And how are people dealing with it? And wh why are they dealing with it? Well, I think NECA is one of the ones where you, um, we can specifically pinpoint something that they are required to do that doesn't let them go just straight to the cloud right. for their services. So we have to address what those requirements are in the case of NECA because in my arena where I'm dealing with the, the rural telephone companies, they're still getting funding you yeah. know, from NECA. Yeah, maybe, I, maybe back up a little bit. Who, who is mm. NECA and why do, they, why do they care about it? Yeah. Well, I think they were originally set up to help support the rural markets that right. you know, they're not gonna have the density like right. an AT&T or a Verizon. Um, to support all the technology and infrastructure that needs to be built. I mean, you go back, you, you got to take it all the way back, what, to the 30s, you know, when the FCC said, hey, we want everybody to have a telephone. Right. Well, how are you going to do that? You know, so you create support mechanisms. NECA helps provide the structure and the, way to, the ways to follow to get to, the, to those support mechanisms. Sure. And those have been in place for years and years, for decades. But now they're fading a lot. But, but change happens slowly, right? I mean, yeah. if you go to an interconnected VoIP provider that wasn't a traditional telco, they don't have to deal with all this. You know, they're just, they're not involved in all those support mechanisms. But for our rural telephone companies, they've been getting this funding so that they can make sure that every rural customer can have a phone. Well, now all that's changing, but not changing quickly. Yes. So even though we're all talking about cloud being the best solution for a lot of different reasons, and these rural telephone companies have to replace their switches. They need a new solution. They can't have a solution that doesn't allow them, for example, to keep intralata calls within the lata. So if you just went to the cloud, the way it would work is that call would go up to the cloud mm -hmm. and then it would be terminated, meaning it would work its way back to the lata. Mm -hmm. Well, in the NECA world, you can't do that yet. That hasn't been allowed. And there's old history behind that that I won't go into that, that started all that, but you still can't do it. So you have to come up with solutions that can work around that. Um, example would be telco bridges. You mm -hmm. know, if you use the telco bridges gateway, we can use it with our customers to solve many problems at the same time. That's what's so nice about it. So we could go in and say, okay, you have NECA requirements. All right, so you can't go straight to the cloud. Okay, well, we can use a gateway that'll help us route the voice traffic in a way that keeps the intralata calls within the lata. Mm -hmm. So now we've overcome the, the biggest hurdle with them getting their NECA funding and yet still being able to go to the cloud. So, okay. but that same device, what we love about it is that same device that you guys offer can also take them, um, manage, help them manage their TDM trunking that they may not be able to completely get rid of yet. Right. Cause that's going away, but again, slowly. Yep. Um, and on top of that, it can help them take the SS7 via SIGTRAN to IP, which they're trying to do. Right. So we actually end up helping them um, through products like the Telco Bridges Gateway solve several problems at once. Okay. But it attacks the, um, the NECA issues so that they can still move to the cloud and take advantages of all the benefits, sure. but without being constrained. Yep. And we do other stuff. Oh, I'll let you take over. Yeah. I'll, I'll stop there. You go ahead. <laughs> I, I was going to say, you know, uh, as part of that, there has been a pivotal shift in the industry uh, from federally funded subsidies moving from voice to broadband. Yeah. And, and going back to the very initial questions that you had asked, yeah. what are some of the things that we're seeing? These organizations uh, who, who have relied on their vendors for so many years suddenly don't have any vendors. And that's why, because there's the money is not there. The right. vendors aren't showing up. And what you've seen is a seismic shift across the entire industry, particularly in the rural space, to move from a voice subsidized market to a broadband subsidized 
each one of the state telephone associations had moved from a voice-centric um, organization to a broadband-centric. Right. Yep. And as part of that, again, with the exodus of the vendors in that space, is also the lack of employees who were interested in voice, the lack of equipment and options available to them. And so this, this need, again, to kind of innovate and drive this, this cloud conversation right. and moving forward with it, Boy, it, it's more present now in, than in an environment ever. that doesn't change fast enough. Exactly, and so you're trying to find ways to yeah. work around some of those obstacles. Yeah, sure. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Anything to add, Jason? No, I think they've hit it. Uh, they've <laughs> covered everything there. I think. Good. Good. Yeah, so that's good. It's interesting because our next question was I asked about you know how, what, what's the transition to broadband, and I think you, you, you Anthony, spoke nicely to this. Um, but I think maybe one thing we hadn't talked about is the funding that's available because of broadband is driving a lot of activity in the rural operators and, and maybe, um, I don't know, maybe Mark, you want to just start with that and just talk a little bit about what you're seeing uh, when it comes to the broadband deployments. Well, I, th I think it's safe to say that all of our customer base, you know, the hundreds of rural telephone companies we work with have all become broadband companies. So they were traditional telephone companies, but now today they're broadband companies yeah. and they're going under their broadband name and sure. all their funding now is coming um, to them so that they will build out fiber to every home, right. which many of them have actually already done. Most of them have done it already yep. or they're yep. in the process of finishing it. So you have that whole transition of them going from being a traditional telephone company, making sure everybody had a phone, to now being a broadband company that makes sure everybody has you know fiber to the home. Um, and then with that though, they're trying to figure out what do we do with the voice services. I right. I've, I've get extremes from I could just get out of the voice business and then I'm like, wait a minute, once you get the fiber to the home, what are you going to ask yourself? What can I sell on that fiber? You know? yeah. So why would you yeah. throw away one of the things you sure. already have? You know? yeah. But having said that, um, now they're trying to figure out what to do with the voice services. And the younger audience that they hire that's very technical is more used to the newer you know, soft switch type of environments. Yeah. They, they don't know how to, the, the traditional switching is not something they're familiar with at all. Sure. So that also is a reason for them to start looking outside of a, you know, put a switch in my central office environment to how do I manage this when I can't necessarily find the talent I need these mm -hmm. days to right. do it? Because right. my talent's all retiring, you know, now. Yeah. Mark, so, how, how instrumental has the CAF been in this whole, you know, migration to broadband? I mean, is well, I mean, that's obviously it's critical because that's where they're getting all their, their funds now. You know, instead of getting it through the traditional voice um, methods that, that were providing the funding previously, they're all reaching out for that and they're, they're turning their whole focus to that. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, literally away from the voice services for the most part, except that they still support them. Mm -hmm. I mean, but they got to come up with more creative ways to support them now going forward. Yeah, interesting stuff. I, I remember at one point or another, it was a survey. They, they uh, surveyed thousands of people in, in their 30s, or 20s to 30s, and asked them, um, if you had the choice of only three things, could you have water, housing, electricity, or something along those lines, and internet, and somehow or another, <laughs> they decided that it was less important to have water than it is to have broadband, so I think the they were impact talking to, of They were talking to my kids about it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Alan, just, just to kind of uh, top off a, a little bit of Mark's comments, you know, this, this move to broadband uh -huh. has had tremendous implications. It's given sure. them opportunities to get customers and new services, yeah. but it's also opened their network to the threat of over the top. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And, yeah. and inevitably, the carrier begins to say to themselves, how in the world do I compete with this? Sure. How do I sure, sure. stay relevant in a space where voice, for example, uh, well, we were all went through the pandemic, and so we know the implications of Zoom and, and Microsoft Teams yep. and things of that nature. Uh, they can't do it in traditional soft switch model. They, they can't integrate fast enough. They can't innovate fast enough. And so in, in that conversation, uh, you know, we begin to, to identify, you know, someone like, I was at 70, 75% of customers prefer to get voice if they're getting voice from their broadband provider. Yeah. So if they're interested in it, what do you have that would keep them interested? And particularly sure. that next generation, because we all know you know, it all starts and stops here, sure. right? And and so integration between landline and wireline, you weren't going to get that from your saw switch model. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's, the over that's, top. Yeah. That's new today. Yep. Yep. So that's a good segue to the next question. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, which is, you know, what does success look like, and and how, you know, as uh, as a provider, if you make this transition and you move um, 
over to you know a soft switch cloud based solution you know what what does success look like is, you know first of all is like for example retaining all your current subscribers is that a metric that would be measured and what other metrics would they be looking at so yeah, Jason go ahead yeah um, I mean I'd, I'd say that's I mean that's table stakes if they lose that then then why bother right yeah, so right, right. I would you know what does success look like I'd say start out with the business outcomes what were the was it to retain and perhaps add some you know cost controls and, and better uh, reliability I suspect yeah. not I think it's more about the business models changing to different profitability centers and different applications that will drive so I think they're starting if you, success looks like if if you have if you are targeting to change your business model and the profitability you know goals that you have on that are achieved that is success mm -hmm. the how you get there whether you transition uh, and the other table stakes of scalability and all that, it's more about the, the, the business model. Success, I think, me, is shifting away from voice to different applications. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. especially on the business user side is, is adding much more value around that contact center, CPAS, all the different applications you can, I mean, it's just, it's Lego blocks. Mm -hmm. it let, it's, let, you know, it's up to these rural providers to figure out what is it that makes their masterpiece. Sure, sure. Yeah, I have to. yeah, I I love this question because I think uh, you know over the span of my career, thirty plus years traveling in in the heartland of America, uh, you begin to recognize how important these telephone companies are to their communities. Sure. In many cases, they're the nicest building in town. Yeah. They employ the most amount of people, and they're the anchor of their community. Yeah. When I think of what success looks like for them, Alan. I think it's to continue to be able to serve the people who know and trust them yeah. for voice services and point. beyond. That's a good point. And how they do that, well, I, think, I think Jason talked about exactly that. They, yeah. they do have to transform. They have to recognize and, and be relevant with that. And sometimes they go kicking and screaming. They're, yeah. they're not always willing to let yeah. go. They want to hold on to it because, like all of us, we don't like change. Sure. But at the end of the day, it's that modernization. But I think at the heart of it, they want to stay there. They want to continue to serve their, yeah. those companies. You know, it's funny because you, you're right. You, um, I was at one of the New York State Telecom Association uh, events a few months ago, and um, they talked about, it was like uh, uh, Hancock Telecom, I think it was, you know, a little tiny community down on the, on the edge of the Catskills. Um, and, you know, they're the sponsor of the baseball uh, Little League team. And they um, were talking about the, you know, the pizza parlor and the bowling alley. And those are the kinds of customers that they've got. And you realize how they're integrated into the fabric. And you're right. You can abandon those people if you somehow. Yeah, these yeah, people, these yeah. people provide our food. Yeah. They provide uh, soldiers in our workforce. Yeah. And, and, and they provide next generation of leaders yep. coming out of that space. And they've got a commitment to those communities. Sure. Staying there is their business. Yep. yep, that's a good point. The fabric of the community. Sure. Any closing comments on Mark? I would just say I think he he hit on a couple things. Both of them did. Uh, but I think that the, what really drives the change for them is the businesses in their area that they don't want to lose. That they're sure. very locked into. Like you said, they're very big parts of their communities, sure. and they don't want to give that up, and they don't want to lose that. So they need more advanced products and services like we were talking about today right but on top of that they they also have a large base that doesn't like change sure. and so all they want to do is maintain that base initially and yet be able to address the other issues we talked about like what am I going to do with my old switch? Sure. How do I replace this stuff? Because mm -hmm. sure. they don't want to lose those customers, but those customers really just want tomorrow what they have yesterday. You know, right. yeah. um, They're not looking for a lot of change. But I think over time, the beauty of it is not just will the, will the businesses get what they're looking for? Yes. But I think the beauty of it is they have large amounts of residential customers, too, that typically think, like you were showing, you know, they're just going to go to a mobile phone. Well, a lot of these rural areas, they can't go to a mobile phone. The yeah. coverage isn't good. Yeah. But even if they could, it's, it's more a matter of how do we educate them on the newer options that are available through these services right. that they're just learning about. Like it's something as simple as just voicemail to email, a lot of them don't do. And yet it'd be a, a really nice enhancement for their residential services. Sure. So I, I think there's a lot that they're reacting to changes they need to do in their environment, but they definitely want to keep what's successful, addressing those changes, but keeping their customer base happy. And I don't think they've even, in many cases, gotten far enough along to say, but how do we make it even better? Yeah. Well, we haven't, we haven't crossed that bridge yet. I think also that they're being pulled by the demographics of the, the workforce who they do serve. 
the demographics are changing, right? That even the millennials, the oldest millennial is 44, I think. Yeah. <laughs> right? So officially it's 44, right? So, so the demographics are going to do that poll for them as well, I think. Yeah, yeah that's good. That's good. Well, we're going to open it up to maybe if any questions and, and from the audience, if you'd like to. In the meantime, I'm just going to pop up. Uh, uh, we've developed a solution brief that talks about this. It's a, a printed set of materials that might be handy uh, to download and share with you know, others in your company or team. Uh, to take a look at. We cover a number of topics in this network transformation, similar to what we talked about here today with this QR code. So with that, any questions from, from our audience and thoughts or maybe things you'd like to share or stories or... Yep, go ahead. So what if for, um, in, like moving forward to the transform network type model, what type of challenges do you, have you tried to work through in terms of like antiquated emergency service systems in counties? Uh, Good. We, we, we serve counties where where we provide four DSOs, and a more national care carrier provides four DSOs, and that's that's and they have an old Motorola telephone switch in there, and it needs those. So you know that's one of the things we get to like well, in the cloud model. Where are those trunks coming from? Yeah. If no. Good question. Right. But they, they still only move when they want to move. Well, that's a great question. I'm just going to try to summarize it for the recording. Um, you know, what about some emergency services, especially, I think, more specifically, some of the legacy connectivity that they depend on, like old DSOs, right? Those kinds of those kinds of circuits. Um, and and I'll, I think I'll toss it to Mark because I think he's closest to that kind of connectivity solution. But we, we so, have dealt with um, there's a variety of different scenarios that you run into that you're talking about. So. We'll, we'll take the simplest one first, obviously, which is when people go to these cloud platforms, typically we're going to have all the connectivity already in place to take care of 911, obviously, um, for you. But that's not really the question he's getting into is where some of these areas, so number one, it's going to replace in many cases, in most cases, it's just going to replace those the local connectivity that used to exist mm -hmm. in those areas, which was TDM trunking. More recently, you'll have folks come into, like I think AT&T, for example, is moving into 22 different states where they're going to manage the 911 services in those mm -hmm. states. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have all these people either do new TDM connections or now they're, they'll actually offer SIP connections um, to do some of that 911 services. So, you know, obviously with our services, we would be able to obviously come through AT&T and still maintain all that same connectivity sure. that any of those um, customers would need. Now, you can take it even deeper, which may get to his point. We have some customers, though, that actually work directly. We'll take the extreme version um, that actually Russ that's here with me um, and I've worked with more recently. They, they actually have the PSAP in the same building as them, and they provide phone service to the PSAP. So whatever service we provide them has to be good enough to make sure that all those 911 calls make it in through them sure, to the PSAP. Sure. And so, um, and believe it or not, we're looking at part of that solution involves the Telco Bridges Gateway. Yep, but yep. Um, so the, the bottom line to answer your question is there are ways to resolve that from the simplest where our services simply take the place of the connectivity that you have today to a more complicated solution that says we work with you to implement the components needed to make sure that, that the calls are flowing through properly to the PSAP if their relationship is with you, even if they're using old technology, which yeah. is the most recent case we ran into. So. Yep. Anything else to add? Yep. Yeah, I, I'll also add, you know, recognize that in most of the states, they're looking at at how they're going to deliver 911 services in the future. And they're, sure. they're reorganizing it statewide. I just at a state association just literally two weeks ago, state of Alaska has an entirely new E911 architecture in which they're choosing how to deliver calls and capabilities to that. And so there's a lot of reorganization that goes around that. Um, but I would agree with Mark, there's a bridge that says, here's how we'll do it today, but we have an eye towards the future uh, to to deliver this and and it's aimly uh, you know focused at, at that type sure. of IP um, standards body from from Nina um, and uh, and looking at it from you know from from all the all of the state not just 
you know, small area. Yeah, and we're going to make sure that it meets all those requirements that are out there for you today. We've already built that into the platform, so that's been done as well. Yep. Anything else? No. Nope. Yes, go ahead. Do yeah. you find that, that you run into challenges with, you know, you mentioned that you're under federal and local, state level, and regulatory issues. Do you find that in certain states you have, it's hard to move, even if you have a local gateway and your SS7 trunks are still coming locally, and you have a, and you have an SBC that's keeping interlata, interlata inside the lata? Mm -hmm. Like, are you still running into issues where you're not compliant with a certain regulatory issues because they're switched? somewhere ephemeral, you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know how to summarize that one. <laughs> it got me with that one. So I, I don't know, maybe Mark, you can try to take a stab at that or? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. No, I, I will say this. I don't think that there's particular states that are harder to make it work in, but there are differences. I'll just give you one example, and that is there's still a lot of folks that within their states, um, have to be or believe they have to be um, the provider of last resort, meaning they cannot not provide local calling when they lose connectivity to the outside world. So you have to help provide solutions that can also bridge that gap in some cases, which is something that, that we work on as well, which is a, a little different twist on our normal solution, but it actually means we end up putting a switch in the central office for them that we manage, but you have to do it because they have to be, quote, the provider of last resort. Or some people, there's other terms they might use for that. But that would be an example where it can vary. Um, did you have any specific examples, though, that you've seen that? Well, with Bailey, we've been working through with our, you know, our cost study people to understand what, if there's any type of jeopardy that comes into place. We have two ILACs and two CLACs. That's so, yeah. so, so then, you know, there's a lot of looking and seeing, you know, is it jeopardizing our ability to tandem traffic between our two switches? Is it jeopardizing the ability to maintain, you know, as a local ILAC even? And it seems like we've been finding that that's probably pretty safe as long as we can keep our local calls local. Yeah, I, I haven't seen anything besides keeping the local calls local or, again, the provider of last resort issue that's popped up. CLEX obviously easy. The ILEX, sometimes the other issue people ask about is, I need to keep my numbers. I own my own numbers. I can't port them to your platform because of some of those same support mechanisms that we right. talked about previously. Okay, that's fine. So we just keep that in place. Those calls continue to come in through your tandem, in your case, which is good because you control that. And you can make it sip if and when you need to, you know. But um, so, yeah, I, I don't. I haven't come across anything that was a showstopper for sure. folks. Sure. Yeah, Anthony. Uh, technically, I think the answers are there to solve the problems that you're talking about, yeah. and and those objections have been addressed, and and I think they're fairly consistent across the body of of companies and states that we're working in. What is unique are the requirements for the tariffs that your organization has to file for changes in those types of services. And so your regulatory person on staff, when she first hears about cloud and she first hears about taking IP traffic, her eyes light up wide. Because in reality, what she's facing is perhaps years of rewriting tariffs that have been in place for quite some time. Yeah, it's not that they can't be changed, it's just the, the it time, time and effort. And in each state, that's different. And that, that experience is a different, uh, different part of the equation and well it's not just it's not just technical it's it's also the the tariff side of things which yeah. no one even thinks right. of right. Yeah. Yeah. good good well uh, we're just uh, about out of time here I want to thank uh, first of all I want to thank my panel for joining us today I really appreciate you spending some time with it and uh, thank you uh, those of you who joined us here today really very much appreciate it and uh, well, let's give you uh, everyone a round of applause I think so much yeah thanks Alan thanks yep. guys thank you Alan thanks guys